Hi everyone, it's such a privilege to be able to speak to you today, even if I'd rather sing. But all jokes aside, have you ever made a plan or worked towards something only for everything to change? Today I want to speak to you on embracing God's plan when his plan looks different from yours. You might know or recognize me from HTBB worship, but there's something else you should know about me. I am a planner. I love a plan. No goal is too big or too small. I can make a plan for it. In fact, I love plans so much, I've managed to make a career out of it. I take a strange delight in identifying the goal, planning the steps to achieve the outcome, and meticulously knocking off each and every one, making sure everyone stays on track. Ask my husband and children. I've always got a plan and a long list of activities that need to be completed with an acute attention to every detail. But what I've learned and experienced from my incessant need to plan, whether that's in the context of my career, my relationships with others, even the location or proximity of my family, is that I have a loving father who actually knows best. About 13 years ago, my life was completely on track, well, according to me. For the first time in my married life, I think we were about 10 years in, I was about to live in close proximity to my mum. I was so excited. I'm super close to my mum. We still talk every couple of days despite the current time difference and distance. Now, I'd been living in New York for about three years and my mum was about to move all the way across the Atlantic Ocean from the UK to be two hours up the road. I couldn't have planned it better if I tried. My husband and I were about to have our first baby and I was elated. My vision of how my life would be when I had kids was coming to fruition. Grandma, babysitter, milestone achieved. We had a great group of friends. I just got a promotion, life was good. And then we got some news. Kevin's company were making some changes and that meant we had to quickly pack up our lives and move back to the UK. UK. I mean, how so? I'd made a plan. I'd planned the weekends, how we would spend them with my mum, how I would balance my work life. I'd picked a nursery. I knew what I wanted to achieve at work. It was all planned out. And then it was all swiftly gone. And the truth is, it was a really hard blow. I questioned God so much in that season. I petitioned. I cried. I tried to find solutions. I even wondered what had we done to deserve what felt at the time as a harsh punishment. But nothing was working and reluctantly I came to the realisation this is happening and what I had planned for us wasn't it. Maybe you find yourself in a similar season of life right now where things just aren't going as you plan. Maybe you haven't heard back from that company or university you applied to. Perhaps you don't have the spouse or child you thought you'd have by now, or maybe a decision you made at work hasn't quite panned out as you had imagined. How do you navigate the tension between holding on to hope while also surrendering to God's plan and direction in your life? What do we do when the plans we've made, the milestones we want to achieve, don't look like the ones God has set out before us? In that moment when we realise that God's plan for our lives might differ from our own, the realisation can be challenging. It can lead to confusion and even feel disheartening. And perhaps you find yourself in a place of uncertainty, doubt and questioning. But it is precisely in these moments where our faith is tested, our true surrender to God's will is revealed. Let's read together. Proverbs 3 verses 1 to 13. My son, do not forget my teachings, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favour and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honour the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke. 
because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father the son he delights in. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. Amen. So what do we do then when we realise that God has a different plan than the one we had in mind? Proverbs 3 outlines three ways in which we can move towards embracing these changes. Number one, acknowledge the limits to our understanding. Number two, trust in God's sovereignty. And three, invest in learning and growing. Number one, acknowledging the limits to our understanding. So let's set the scene. You're feeling confused and uncertain. Everything around you is in a state of change and you just need some advice. Imagine you're given the opportunity to get advice from the wisest person on earth. And better yet, this person is your dad. King Solomon is probably one of the world's most well-known kings of the ancient world. He was the third but most successful king of Israel and he reigned for over 40 years. His reign has often been depicted as an era of unprecedented peace and prosperity. He successfully built the first temple in Jerusalem, but more than that, he was renowned for his wisdom. I'd go so far to say his greatest achievement is a legacy that we still have access to today. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon's Song of Songs, in which he compiled some of his greatest lessons. What we read in Proverbs 3 is a father's speech to his son, a letter of advice and guidance, urging him to follow in his ways. He says, My son, do not forget my teachings, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity, peace and prosperity, and to pursue wisdom, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. What Solomon is essentially saying is that there are limits to our understanding and leaning on them can result in a treacherous road. But if we lean not on our own own understanding and trust in the Lord, he will make our path straight. In order to move on from the disappointment of things not going our way, the way we envisage, we have to firstly recognize that there are inherent limitations of our human understanding. As the prophet Isaiah says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. God's perspective is infinite while ours is finite. Let's take a look at this image. What can you see? Perhaps you see a woman and she's resting on a small hump of dirt. She's looking from an elevated position and she's taking in the view of a small settlement with two homes seen in the distance. But is there more to this image that we can see? Are we only perceiving a fraction of the bigger picture? Are we limiting the vision for our own lives instead of letting the creator of heaven and earth lead and position us into the vision he has? Let's take a look at that image again, but this time with an uninhibited view. We see there's so much more to the picture. When we stop focusing on just one point, we can see so much more. We can see the full beauty of the scene, the tree framing the view, the hills far in the distance, but we can also see something completely different. We see the image of a man's portrait, not something we expected to see at all. Our limited vision often causes us to fixate on the immediate. And that immediate could be the next month, next three years, the next five, even the next 10. But God says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. This verse was originally written to the Israelites who were in exile in Babylon. And this was an exile that lasted for 17 years. Now you can imagine the children of Israel were probably feeling so discouraged and hopeless, but God wanted to reassure them that he had not abandoned them and he had good plans for their future. Just like he reassured me and just like he wants to reassure you, you can take comfort in this verse today, knowing that God has good plans for you, even if you may be going through difficult times or are facing certain futures. It's important to trust in God's plan even when we don't understand it. Sometimes we can get so focused on our own plans and desires and stuck in this immediate and limited view that we forget to seek God's will for our lives. 
It's important to regularly pray and seek his guidance so we can align our plans with his. It's often the case that then when we're out of the other side of a season and we look back at it retrospectively, that we can see the plan that God had for us was far greater than the one we had mapped out. If all of those years ago, I hadn't finally finally relented and learned that I needed to seek God's guidance and place my trust in him, I wonder, would I be here today in this amazing country, a part of such an exciting time in the journey of HTBB? Would I be surrounded by this amazing community I found if I'd kept pushing to figure out a way to stay in New York? We often don't realize that where God puts us is the very place we need to be to receive what he wants to give us. So we've acknowledged our limited understanding. What's next? Secondly, we have to trust in God's sovereignty. In verse six, Solomon continues, in all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and shun evil. Is it possible to submit to someone that you don't respect or recognize as a leader? Is it possible to submit to someone that we haven't first allowed into our lives? In the original language, the word submit here refers to acknowledging and recognizing God, recognizing him as first. And I wonder, do you know God as your sovereign God? The definition of the word sovereignty is supreme power or authority. Now, you may or may not have watched the recent coronation of King Charles III. I have to admit, I wasn't that excited to watch it, but I was visiting my brother and he was super excited. My mum was over from the US and so my brother made it into a real family event. And I have to be honest, I found myself so intrigued by the whole thing. I was fascinated by all the traditional elements and the symbolic acts. And what was evident to me was that the coronation rituals emphasized the religious and divine nature of the monarch's authority. You see, there's this belief in the divine right of kings as a concept, and it's been adopted by many societies in Europe in which the assertion is that kings derive their authority from God and could not therefore be held accountable for their actions by any earthly authority such as a parliament. To reinforce this belief, religious elements are incorporated into the crowning ceremony to symbolize the monarch's divine appointment. During King Charles III's coronation, we see there was the placing of the crown on the head and the presence of two scepters and the orb representing his spiritual role, his temporal power and his religious and moral authority. I really found it so fascinating. But some do say, you know, well, if he doesn't rule the country, like what is he actually doing? But as a monarch, he does exercise the highest authority and power. And this led me to think about how much more authority does the king of kings have? If we go along with this premise of the divine right of kings, then how much more powerful is the sovereignty of our God? Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Part of a sovereign's role is to make the best decisions for the ones they rule over. We are fortunate that our sovereign is also our father in heaven and he weaves everything together for the good of his children. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. The good in this context isn't necessarily about our earthly comfort, but it's more about our conformity to Christ, aligning our behaviors, our attitudes and actions, becoming like-minded with Christ and drawing closer in fellowship with him. Verses 29 and 30 goes on to say, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters and those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. 
This closeness and fellowship that we develop with God through our trust that he is sovereign and has predestined our lives causes us to bear good fruit for his kingdom and results in a final glorification of a reward in eternity in heaven. God has always been doing good for us. You see, the overarching story of scripture is that God loves you. At creation, he made humanity in his image. He designed you out of love for love. At the cross, he sent Jesus to pay the penalty for your sin. And one day, Jesus will return to establish his rule on earth, to right every wrong and to defeat sin, injustice and death. And so when we open ourselves to him and we align in his ways, when we trust in his sovereign plans, we begin to see with a new perspective that God is still in control. So now we've acknowledged the limits to our understanding and we know we should trust in God's sovereignty. What next? How about we invest in learning and growth? In the final verses of Proverbs 3, Solomon says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father the son he delights in. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. God's plan for our lives, though it may be divergent from our own, is designed for our spiritual growth and maturity. In order to grow, we need to learn to strengthen our faith. If you find yourself at standstill waiting for God to move you towards the next path, or you're getting over the disappointment of one of your plans not coming to fruition, or maybe you see the plan and you're hesitating to move forward through fear, here are two ways in which you can begin right now to strengthen your faith. Number one, Pray like God's in the room sitting beside you. Mark 11, 23 instructs us to pray without doubt in our hearts and believe that what we say will happen. It's okay to lift up our every need to God. It's okay to give him every single one of our worries and fears. And it's okay to ask God to intervene in our lives. He wants to hear your voice and he wants a personal relationship with you. If you don't do it yet, or you think you could do it a little more often, I wonder if you will be willing to give daily prayer a go. It will invite God into your life and help you establish a deeper level of trust. I find that carving out time in part of my day to connect and to talk to God through prayer helps me to trust him a little more each day. On that day in New York, when I cried out to God in prayer and I surrendered to his will and to his way, and I spent time in his presence, building my connection with him, I had no idea this is where I would end up. I couldn't see that giving up what I thought was a good life will be exchanged for a better one that I'm living all these years later. As our prayer life grows, we might net get all the pieces of the puzzles immediately, but daily prayer allows our faith to grow stronger because some of us will have a clear vision of the direction God is taking us to, but for some, we might not have sight of the end goal or the milestone to to be achieved. But day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, as we surrender to God's plan, as we keep connected to him in prayer, That is the space in which he will reveal his vision over our life. And where we look at where we were and where we see God has taken us to, we'll be reminded that all the puzzle pieces make sense. And finally, I encourage you, read the scriptures. Knowing God's word goes hand in hand with trusting him and praying. Read his promises and then have great faith in God that they will come to pass. Pray them over your life. In God's word, we find answers, we find strength and hope and love and peace and joy. We also find the promises of provision and instructions to keep us away from sin. We gain wisdom, knowledge and understanding in our lives through his instructions. You see, Solomon wasn't just born wise. In 1 Kings 3, we are told that Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father, David. These instructions were to keep all the commandments of God, to study the law. And one night before the temple was completed, Solomon was making an offering to God and God asked him, 
He said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. And Solomon chose wisdom to govern God's people because he knew he couldn't do it alone. This shows us that wisdom is something we have to seek and it's acquired over time. And it's about respecting God. You respect God when you obey his commandments and read the Holy Scriptures, his, his inspired word. Solomon also says, I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than darkness. Even Jesus had wisdom that developed over time. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Just as we studied as children to increase our knowledge, we should study God's word to increase our knowledge of him. To know God is to truly love him. So today, if you find yourself living a life that doesn't look like the one you thought you'd have, or if you can sense God calling you in a different direction to the path you had planned, then I encourage you to acknowledge the limits of your own understanding, trust in God's sovereignty, and invest in learning and growing by strengthening your faith in prayer and scriptures. Then you will be able to embrace God's plan, even if it looks different from your own, opening yourself up to receive all that God has planned for you. Let's pray. God, as we come at this time, we thank you for the reminder that your will and your way for our lives is so much greater than the ones we could ever come up with ourselves. Father, we pray that you will bless us with courage and patience to step into those roads that you have called us to. Help us not to be discouraged when things don't look as we want them to, but help us to trust and to have faith in you that you only have good things in store. Amen. And now let's worship. Yeah.